Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here um, for many, many, many reasons. But I want you to know that I've spent a lot of time on this place whilst we were designing and building it. And um, I usually don't go back to projects that we finish for a period of time. I call it detox periods. Uh, but this one came a little bit earlier, so here we are. Today I want to ask you to join me on a journey, an extraordinary trajectory through time that weaves the historical, the architectural, and my own personal journey um, to perhaps explain how this project was conceived, um, what were the moments of desperation and inspiration, and what led us to this place, to this point in time that we call Eleftheria Square. I would like to introduce you, first of all, to one of the main protagonists of this story. Do you know who this person is? Anybody? Well, his ne I didn't know him either in the, at some point, uh, especially when, and not until um, we started the, the project here in Eleftheria Square, and his name is Giulio Savorniano. Giulio Savorniano was a brilliant Venetian architect and engineer who was commissioned by the Republic of Venice in the middle of the 16th century to, amongst other things, design the walls of Nicosia, which you see here all around you. And he's one of the most innovative and influential defensive architects of the Renaissance. Savorniano's work spans <clears throat> the whole of the Eastern Mediterranean and uh, he worked on a number of Venetian fortifications in many different spots, many different islands, all of which were Venetian trading outposts during the time. His most important work can be found in Kerkira, in Corfu, in uh, Heraklion, Candia, and later years in uh, Nicosia, here in Cyprus, right here. In later years of his life, Giulio Savorniano was recalled back to Venice, where he spent uh, the last part of his life rebuilding the walls of Palmanova. Nicosia's walls and Palmanova's walls are both some of the most important UNESCO sites that we have today. He integrated the latest innovations of his time into the design of these walls. The original Lusignan stone walls that circumscribed uh, Nicosia in the 14th and 15th century were bastions made of wall, very upright, like traditional castles. And the first thing he did was he demolished the old walls, he consolidated the perimeter of the city to make it smaller and easier to defend. But also he did something remarkable. He inclined the walls, gave them a bigger inclination so that they could easier deflect the bullets that were going to go on them. Moreover, um, he took the material from the demolished walls and he recycled it to rebuild the new construction. And he removed what was a defensive architecture tradition at the time, the stones from the top part of the wall, so that they would better cushion against the impact of the cannonballs. And it's quite remarkable, if you think about it, that such a counterintuitive way of designing becomes a genius, absolutely genius appreciation of how the action takes place and what it takes to be able to, to live these, these things and these notions in, in one's mind. The walls of Nicosia are considered some of the most beautiful in the world, a marvel of defensive fortifications of the time. His designs are based on strict geometrical definitions that uh, are mathematical equations that define the proportions between bastions, the distance to run from one bastion to the other. The size of the bastion has something to do with the amount of people that is needed to man those defensive positions and to have outlook all into the open, into the open valley. It took about eight months to build it using labor from a significant number of local Cypriots who needed to be defended. And unfortunately, the walls were never truly finished. 
The bridge connecting the old and the new city was built by the British in 1882, and it was used to connect uh, the, um, the old and the new city, of course, and to create passages. It was a modern sort of way of dealing with, with, with old cities. And since the independence of Cyprus on the 1st of October 1960, it came to be called Eleftheria Square, Freedom Square, a place where events and rallies took place um, and remained an informal gathering point for people who lived in the city uh, until 2005 when we won the competition to redesign uh, the bridge and the, surrounding, and the surrounding area. We started with an ambition to design a bridge as a suspended square that would respond to the urban conditions of this energetic but also chaotic historic but also divided city. We wanted to make a landmark that would give definition to the city center. Our competition scheme intentions was to design a welcoming space of free flow and movement, a space of openness and connectivity, a welcoming space that would enhance the connection between the old and the new city and that ended up exploding in, in, in the 20th century out of the old city walls. And we wanted to create vital connections between this mode and the surrounding street levels around it, bringing people into it, like today. The initial idea was to propose a floating bridge over the moat to inflate this bridge, make it wider as a dish to become a space of civic assembly. Architecture, you know, can be a very powerful instrument for social and civic activation. The bridging square was inclined on one side to give a sense of kinesthesia as people would move on it and oriented itself towards the old town hall to create a dialogue with it. It was a very theatrical space. And um, when we started working on it, I walked the site several times and slowly I began to understand the majesty of this uh, archaeology and what it stood for and I understood and appreciated more and more its beauty but I also understood that in our era these monuments and these walls are not uh, testaments of defensive prowess but they are instead integrated parts of our culture and as such we had to see it and that led me to think that something important was missing from our design initially we started looking at the maps of the city, and it soon became clear that the so-called green line signifying the historical that signified the historical evolution of the city has been violently interrupted. It pains me to see this city, the beautiful city of Nicosia, still being divided 50 years on. I wanted to make this project more than the stated competition aims. I wanted to make this an architecture of healing. I had a deep intuition about this, but also had no clue how this could be done. So we set off to do this step by step. We set off to research the landscapes of the world for inspiration. We studied the gardens of the Versailles that were built by Antre Le Nôtre in, in 1661. It took about 40 years there to build them. And they were built for the Sun King Louis XIV who later got executed by the French revolutionaries. But what we learned there was that the axial geometries of the park, the long and deep perspectives that gave this sort of linearity were a reflection of former neoclassical French architecture, but also a reflection of man's domination over nature. These magnificent gardens with the state-of-the-art sculptures and art installations explored the notion of the universal landscape with wealth exploited nonetheless from the American and African colonies. After all, this was the height of the Renaissance. We also studied the aesthetics of the English Romantic Gardens that were developed a little bit later in the 18th century. Romantic landscapes embraced the beauty of savage freedom of the natural world and hinted at political and social disruption. The Arts and Crafts Garden was a rejection of industrialized England and wanted to restore the landscape to its pre-industrial ideals. 
And then we moved on into the new world. New York City Central Park was created in the late 19th century, and it's a masterpiece of landscape architecture. It incorporates a variety of landscapes and experiences, and it's based on the ideas of the City Beautiful Movement. It's one of the most iconic examples of 20th century uh, landscape design. But please notice the huge scale both of the city of New York and the park make the human feel diminished within it. It soon became obvious to me that we needed a different strategy for this Cypriot landscape. Despite Nicosia's smaller scale, Eleftheria Square demanded a more intimate and a more humane scale. So the challenge for us was how to make this small piece of land this part, to be part of the grand landscapes and to be as important and to be as impactful as they are despite its small size. And uh, it was after one of my many and frequent trips to the island, after two days of very strenuous conversations about technical challenges, budgets, delays, contractual issues, the whole lot. And I walked out of the meeting room and I started walking on this place. It was a construction site. There were bulldozers around and compressors and builders. It's a chaos, it was a chaos. And um, I was trying to figure out where we were, what was going on. And it was in a similar season now, it was in the autumn. It was a day like today. And uh, the gray clouds were flying over and suddenly that first train, that first drop fell into the ground. And you know what happens when the, when the, when the raindrop falls into the ground is the scent of the place begins to emerge and suddenly, suddenly that time stopped for me. And this splash of water, the smell that came out of this place exploded an infinite number of memories that I had deeply stored in me for all these years that I was working overseas, away from home. Childhood memories of a past distant but also close came rushing in my mind. First steps as kids, barely being aware of what was going on. My first kindergarten was in a trench, makeshift bomb shelter with a piece of corrugated metal on top of it. And I realized then that I was deeply connected with these people, with my family and my friends. And this was the moment when I realized what we had to do here. And then this idea of the Cypriot garden emerged. It started growing in me. Um, the idea of the gardener as the carer of the garden. This interactive and symbiotic relationship became very meaningful. And as this idea grew, our mission began to change. We started looking deeper to find the cultural treasures of this historical land. In this process, we developed an affectionate relationship with the Cypriot landscape and its people. As its gardeners, we worked with the sun and the water, the landscape and the trees to create a model for a new Cypriot garden that you can see all around you. We researched traditional knitted patterns and medieval embroidery and visited villagers that do this for several centuries. And these people still live in the village of Lefkara. And if you have a chance, you can go visit them. As memories reemerged, the experience of the project started to become that of a homecoming. Coming back to the island and being reintroduced to my people, my tribe, was a tough and strange process almost an existential sense of knowing something intimately, but also feeling quite separate from it. It was an uncanny experience. These people who are often sensitive, sometimes a bit rude, sometimes distraught by life's problems, or simply just annoyed by the excessive heat, are in fact extremely resilient, friendly, and welcoming. There is something timeless and humane about these Cypriots that I found simply irresistible. Opening my heart and mind to these beautiful Cypriot characters was a real privilege. 
It was my homecoming and coming back to this tribe, my tribe. The important lesson for me was to remember that we all belong to one tribe or another. And you know, we all have our origins and backgrounds. And so I realized that instead of just thinking globally, we can consider how we can build a Cypriot garden as much as we can build a Maltese garden, a Beirut garden, an English garden, a Moscovite garden. We can begin to trace these landscapes of people and cultures and languages and histories of the world. This is what we want to preserve. This is the richness of humankind. And we must become alerted to it to remind ourselves where we come from so that we can figure out where we're going. We studied endless compositions to find the one that felt right. My team and I wanted to develop something truly unique and meaningful. We wanted this composition to be a timeless representation of what we saw and what we experienced here. We spared no effort and we gave it our all. And this was the scheme that felt right. It was a pattern made of geometrically opposite shapes, the stars and the leaves. And these shapes fit geometrically within the system of triangulations and had a complementary relationship with each other. We turned it into a gradient transition that went from one side of the mold to the other and uh, seamlessly and harmoniously knitted this pattern together. At this point, we knew we had the project that we wanted to build. We interpreted these patterns into functional paving designs that work in harmony with the local climate. Each line becomes a breathing gap and a drainage that allows the rain to fall into the ground, nourishing the substrates. And then it allows the ground to breathe out, to dry, and as it dries quicker, it helps to preserve the soft stone of these walls from erosion. Each of these triangular territories was populated with a series of unique constellations of water features that serve to cool the microclimate and provide much needed environmental comfort. And trees indigenous to the Cypriot biome, complemented with more exotic varieties and species, provided much needed shade and also helped to dry the ground faster, minimizing the seeping of water and moisture into the walls. The overall composition of the Cypriot garden is both simple and complex. It highlights that each unique part making every element an indivisible part of the whole. We worked feverishly to develop this composition as a multi-layered synthesis of archaeology, ecology, landscape design, and engineering. The intuition I had since the beginning became now clear. This was an architecture of urban activism. It was an architecture of healing an injured territory and healing through a deep understanding of what sustainability for this place and these people means. The suspended bridge then turned into a canopy, shading the lower part of the square during the hot summer months, and its transversal openings often create a soft breeze of air that runs through it. This signifies the first opening, unifying the parts of the moat. The garden spread underneath the bridge, becoming the unifying element, and occasionally came up to the streets, inviting people in. We went further to encode the planar geometry of Eleftheria Square as a series of interconnected nodes, compasses of sorts, similar to the one that this man is standing on. Each node, we call them rosettes in Greek, signifies a moment in time a milestone, and each moment opens up to a number of other potential milestones. This particular diagram I like very much because I'm an architect, but because of also what it means. The extraordinary timeline is a very special animation to me. It represents a passage through time, the time of now, the any now. This passage of time symbolizes the trajectory of this beautiful island, through its moments of hardship and through its moments of joy. And ultimately, it's a timeline of hope and redemption. 
So we opened the skylight right behind you in the bridge and shaped it using the passage of the sun so that every 1st of October at 1 p.m. exactly, the light of the sun falls on 999 crystal lights signifying the gift of freedom and self-determination as a celestial event. We put small cypress trees in nurseries early on so that they can grow by the time the garden is ready for plantation. And what we started as a journey full of unknowns, full of challenges, step by step, by, the, by getting to know the people you knew very little about, the impossible became possible. The dream became the reality. And I discovered that on this beautiful part of the Eastern Mediterranean, it's filled with people who have something good to share. So with this project, we planted a seed that will grow in time. I always said that it's not us making the projects, it's the projects that make us. And this journey taught us that what we have started shall make us who we must become to find peace internally and externally. This project is not finished. It can never be finished. Eleftheria Square is a space of meetings and chance encounters, a space to meet someone you don't know, a space to see and observe someone with a different lifestyle than you. It's a space for dreamers, it's a space for realists, and it's a space for poets. A space of solace and a space of escape from the mundane. It's a space where we can essentially meet ourselves. So we must dedicate this project to the future generations. And looking at what we have achieved so far, I believe now stronger than ever that it is possible to reunify Cyprus. Perhaps we can take this mode of conflict this graveyard and transform it into a space of hope and we can give it an afterlife and make it a space of peace. We saw this experience as a prayer and a prayer that lasted for about 15 years altogether. We see this ring of light expand around the whole of this beautiful city as a free space to reestablish a connection between all the people of Cyprus. We wanted to transform this place of conflict into a place of culture, hope, redemption, and peace. And with this, to pay, perhaps, the debts of the past, so that we can move confidently into a future with a clean heart and a better and more positive future for all of us. Thank you very much.